Good evening. Welcome to the Eastline Board of Finance special meeting. Tonight is Monday, April 1st, 2024. The time is 5.30. I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is delegations. Delegations is the portion of our evening where uh, members of the public can address the Board of Finance on any of the agenda items that we're going over tonight. Would anyone like to? And if you could just state your name and address. Thank you. My name is Bruce Cohen. I live at 31 Upper Walnut Hill Road here in East Lyme. I'd like to read uh, a, a statement uh, that takes about three minutes regarding the East Lyme Giving Garden. I am the uh, president and director of education of the Giving Garden. The East Lyme Giving Garden is a 501c3 organization whose mission is to provide healthy food to those facing food insecurity in New London County as well as educate the community on gardening methods and human health topics. This is our fourth year at Fort Church Lane, and we're very grateful to the Flanders Baptist Church for letting us use their land. In the first year, we grew 4,000 pounds of produce. The next year, 7,000 pounds, and last year, nearly 11,000 pounds of healthy vegetables. All of it is distributed to the food pantries and soup kitchens through a partnership with Gemma Moran United Way that feeds over 1,000 families every month. Our education program provides hands-on learning in the garden, as well as free seminar program where local subject matter experts and farmers share their knowledge on topics that range from regenerative farming methods to nutritional awareness. You all knew most of this before I came. In fact, the town of East Lyme, local businesses, and community have been extremely generous in their support. But what most people don't know is that the Giving Garden is more than what I've just described. The East Lime Giving Garden is a regenerative garden, which is what I want to bring to your attention this evening. Regenerative gardening, or farming, is sweeping the country and the world because it solves so many of the issues we have created with conventional farming methods. A regenerative farmer grows soil. Yes, I know it sounds funny, but you can actually grow healthy soil over time. That single activity has a multitude of impacts on our health, our environment, the amount of farmable land, our water supply, the nutritional value of our food, and food security. Closer to home, we have all seen and experienced the horrible impact that chronic diseases such as cancer, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, obesity, anxiety, and depression, and they've been on the rise globally since the early 1900s. Countless publications have linked these public health crises to the food we eat and highlighted that these disorders can be reversed or impacted by eating foods that are not processed or contaminated with toxic agents. The East Lime Giving Garden is promoting a grassroots effort to bring this kind of awareness to our community. Our seminar attendees include local backyard gardeners as well as seasoned farmers who want to hear internationally recognized experts talk about regenerative practices. Bringing awareness to our children and ultimately their children is important because they will be strapped with fixing the mistakes we have made, albeit with the best of intentions. This year we have expanded the garden's growing space and are planning to produce well over 12,000 pounds of food. We will continue to impact the health and well-being of our community and appreciate all the support you have to, uh, provided to our mission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen, and thank you for all that you've accomplished. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to an item? Hello, I'm Marjorie Mikoff, 6 C Ridge Road, East Lyme. I'm also the founder and president of Pollinator Pathway East Lyme. There are other pollinator pathways throughout the state, but we are the only single pollinator pathway in a town that's a 501c3, so we can determine our own projects. We are a 501c3 organization totally run by volunteers. 
our science-based primary purpose is to promote native plants for native insects and wildlife indigenous to New England. This partnership process between native plants and native insects does two things. First, it increases the biodiversity of our local ecosystems, which is the foundation of our food web. Secondly, it creates healthy environments for East Lyme residents. In 2020, members of the East Lyme Police Department asked us to create a native plant garden for insects and wildlife in the memory of Betty Murphy, a longtime resident of East Lyme and a longtime employee of the police department. We received private donations and grant money from Sustainable Connecticut that allowed us to complete phase one. We would like to begin phase two and we are asking the town for financial support. I'd like to hand out some photos for you and some literature. And I think I kind of just the right amount. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want us to pass it down? No, everybody gets one. No, I meant for you, in case you wanted to keep talking. Oh, that's okay. That was thoughtful of me. Thank you. Now, I'll hold this up just briefly. This was a rendering of what the garden initially, when it's done, this is what we initially thought it will look like. It's going to take probably 10 to 15 years for it to look like this because we're planting little things that adapt more readily than big things for a variety of reasons. Now, if you look at the first page, with the dogwood tree in the center. This is what we did. Anybody wants to see? By defining the dogwood tree as the focal point, it allowed us to incorporate the woodland edge that is here in my red line here and here along the edge. This is a total woodland strip that separates the public safety complex from Wine Emporium, uh, the condominium development, and West Main Street. So what we did was we extended that woodland border down the slope in front of the tree. This allows a clean border for park and rack employees to maneuver their big mowers on that steep hill. And also, aesthetically, by focusing the tree in the middle of the garden in the lawn, it's aesthetically pleasing because it's in direct sight line from the main entrance of the building. This native garden utilizes spring, summer, autumn, and winter interest with color, bloom, and berries. Now, if you look at the second page, there's an erosion control method that we're adopting where my X's are on the steep slope that parallels the driveway entrance going down. Our garden, here's the tree and the garden swoops up that bank. If we hadn't incorporated this, all that grass would have washed out. You can see to the left where the arrow is as it slopes down the grass is being eroded there and there's not much we can do about that. We don't want to incorporate any more of that lawn into the garden area. It'll be too big aesthetically and it will cost us a lot more in plants. So we have where my X's are on the paper, we've selected some native plants with deep roots that will be installed on that steep slope to control the washout where the wood chips are. Uh, Pollinator Pathway does a lot of things in town. We have seven projects. And I've included a business card, and on the back of it is our website. And I thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions about this project and the way we will spend the money, and if you ever need any of our free services, please reach out to us. That's why we're in town. We're a resource for native plants for every resident in town. We also go to Waterford and Salem, too. Um, thank you very much for letting me have this opportunity. Thank you.
Are there any other members of the public who'd like to speak? No, if not, we'll uh, proceed with new business, which is budget reviews. And uh, we're starting off with general government, uh, 114. Mr. Gervais, I believe. Even though it was left on, it looks like it's still has some juice left. Um, okay. Just gonna walk behind you. You got it. Thank you. All right. So, um, well, while our first selectman is pulling down that lovely sign back there, um, we're just gonna walk through. Uh, government benefits um, and then other miscellaneous uh, expenses that don't really have a better spot in the budget really is what it comes down to. Um, so just starting off at the top, uh, FICA Medicare, uh, we have to pay 6.65% uh, uh, on the employer side for Social Security and Medicare. Um, so that's just a, a calculation based on the overall wages in the budget and for everyone that wants to find out where we pull that from. The expenditures right at the very bottom of the work paper. There's a little uh, a little tabulation there for our FICA Medicare. I have 982 here, um, 978, $5,000 is really a, a rounding error. Or, you know, $5,000 is, uh, we'll plug it there. Uh, workers' compensation, same as liability auto and protection. We're locked into a, a contract with KERMA on that, so that is a contractually obligated rate. Um, the pension numbers. Uh, so it's, this really should be labeled pension and retirement, as we found out last year. We were we were very lucky uh, when when I thought it was the pension number. I asked the uh, our actuary what what uh, we were going to pay into the pension. He told me right around six hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. Lo and behold, the board of ed pays a little bit into that as well as water and sewer. But on the town side, we also pay for non-affiliated uh, seven percent into the retirement. So uh, luckily, we're we're going to fall right in there at about six forty. So um, this particular year, um, I'm budgeting a six hundred thousand dollar payment. This year was a five hundred a four hundred fifty thousand dollar payment. Um, because if you've, if you've been apprised of what's happening with our pension, we're amortizing our gains and losses over a 10-year period to smooth out um, the town's actuarially determined contribution. Um, so this year, uh, it, was, it was about 575. We uh, went conservative and said, okay, I'm assuming $600,000, what the breakdown is amongst the various um, affiliations that pay into it. Um, so overall, six hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars. I think the general fund's gonna have to kick in on this particular one. I rounded up to six fifty. So, just so everyone's aware of uh, my rounding ups and rounding downs. Um, you know, when we're talking six hundred fifty thousand, you know, ten thousand dollars is a nice tenth of a percent cushion. So, um, not much going on there. Uh, life insurance. Um, it looks like it's a large increase, but if you look over here at the actual. Um, I don't think we've been budgeting properly. So this, we're just budgeting to the actual, right? So we see 2023 is actual, 16.5. Um, so uh, we're budgeting to the actual there. Same as long-term disability insurance. Um, this is not going up 25%. I think this is just more in line to the actual expense. And that's based on the latest bills we've had. I just take that, make sure we're not missing anybody or you know, have some sort of correction on the bill and then extrapolate that out. Oops. Sorry. Hello, Mary. Um, okay. Uh, Health care and dental. Uh, there's two things that are happening here. We obviously have a, every year we have an increase there as well as we have a few employees um, that are there. Currently in the budget, we have Firefighter 11 for a full year. And then we have um, seven months of that IT engineer as well left in the budget. So that's where we come up with that percentage. Uh, retirement liability, if any employee uh, retires in town, um, uh, we have to pay that, those individuals out for either sick vacation 
um, personal, holiday, comp time, whatever is based on their union contract. So it's not like we just we're pulling numbers out of a hat. It's whatever is um, you know contractually obligated. There is a worksheet where I have um, listed individuals that meet uh, the sweet mark of I think over 80 between years of service and age um, that are kind of eligible for retirement um, and kind of factor that into this count. Last year you can see $194,000 we paid out. So 200. I originally did 250, but tough budget year. I think we can make it work with 200. There was also um, in this particular year we had a um, early retirement incentive. Um, so some of the employees there was a little additional. Um, we didn't pay them more to get them out the door, but there was an additional incentive uh, in the pension to to get them to retire. So that's why that number was a little higher. Um, and I anticipate we will have some savings in that $200,000. Um, pending everyone retires this year. Uh, does anyone have any questions with personnel services? So that's like one section of the budget. We can go down to legal next. Everyone good there? Okay. Legal transcripts. Um, we really don't spend money out of here unless there is a, um, a pending litigation lawsuit where we have to uh, transcribe like you know the zoning minutes things like that so that's really more of a contingency there that thousand dollars because you can see there's zero dollars used in 2023 there I believe this year we spent I think two thousand dollars so far I think we had to transcribe some of the I believe it was zoning or planning one of those lovely commissions we had to um, transcribe the minutes for that um, legal ads this is, you would think in this day and age with technology, we'd be able to just post a, an advertisement online, but uh, those media conglomerates have a, have a good stranglehold in those capital buildings. So we still have to pay in, um, you know, thousands of dollars in legal bills um, and legal advertisements. Uh, and this is just really to get it to actual. You can see we spent $24,000 last year. Um, so we're hoping we can do it for 22.5, but that's a, that's a challenged line. Uh, similarly, general government. Last year we spent over 140,000. Oh, don't want to do that. Stand by. Um, $140,000 last year in legal. Um, there was a charter revision. So I'm, uh, you know, when we look at the bills, we can see about $25,000, 26,000 was was charter revision. Just at a, you know, just looking at it real quickly. So. Um, in conversations with the first selectman, uh, we think we can keep it, uh, you know, to about a 5% increase there. Um, and just, you know, internally we'll do a little more research before we reach out to the uh, attorneys to get a, an opinion. Um, zoning, uh, just, you know, another challenge department legally. Uh, last year we almost spent the full 40, uh, so $42,000 slight increase just to keep up with uh, the increased fees. Uh, labor, we have one on the town side uh, this year coming up. It's the UPSU contract. Um, we budgeted a little less last year. It wasn't that contentious, so I think that'll be a uh, we'll be able to resolve that pretty easily. Um, labor, public safety. We are still negotiating with the fire department. Uh, the police are negotiated, I believe, to through June 30, 2026. So we are good here for that one. But it's the the fire department. We are going to need a, a few dollars there to to negotiate that one still. Then planning, conservation. Um, you know, whatever comes up down there. Uh, and then this police accreditation, there was money uh, set aside for legal bills regarding the police accreditation. We no longer need that. I, it's rolled, whatever there is for bills is now rolled into uh, the police department. So um, in discussions with the chief, we were able to get rid of that entire line. Does anyone have any questions regarding legal? Oh, pretty comprehensive. All right, not much. Um, those are those are hard numbers. There's not much, you know, changing those really, for the most part. Um, services that are contractually obligated um, and operations. Uh, so just so everyone knows, on the unemployment side, the town pays one to one. So an employee um, receives is eligible for unemployment compensation. We pay one to one. Um, there's no unemployment insurance with the municipality, so if we're on the hook for forty thousand dollars to pay someone out, this line we will be asking for a, for an increase. Um, so we're, we're just going to keep the same ten thousand um, dollars and cross our fingers. Uh, eviction moving and storage, we've decreased that line by fifty percent to two hundred dollars. Last year in the budget, there was some money left over to purchase a um, 
storage container, like a like a metal container that I believe resides at the brush yard, if I'm not mistaken, or the transfer station. It might be the same name, um, unless there's two locations. But um, I, I believe it's just sitting at the transfer station. So when you get evicted or um, you're forced to leave your house, the t some some uh, in some archaic law, I'm sure the town's responsible for that. So um, I, don't ask me why. So instead of paying for a storage unit, which you can see that $597 the year before, that's like a week or you know a, a month of a storage unit. It's not very much, and it's a lot of money. So it was easier just to buy a $2,400 storage container. We have it forever. Um, you know, when you when someone in town gets evicted, their stuff goes up here. There's a lock on it, um, and so we don't have to go to a storage facility place we can just do it right from the transfer station which has security cameras and the whole the whole shebang how, how long do we have to keep those belongings like is this going to get full and there, then we have to buy another or do there's a pretty to, quick turnaround so we can i dispose? think it's like maybe a month or two um and, and this happens a couple times a year it's not very frequent but just when it does there's so little money in the budget it's just always every you know one instance breaks the budget in that line so um Ron Bentz, the building maintainer, the supervisor downstairs, he spearheads that. So it was his idea to really, him and um, uh, uh, Sandy Anderson, the first selectman's assistant, who deal with those, the evictions, they, they thought it'd be best just to buy a container. So when we have an eviction, we move them right into the container. There's no fees. No one has to you know worry about it. it's under it's lock and key. Um, and we don't have to pay or worry about giving our card to a storage mm -hmm. container. Because a lot of those storage companies, they want a credit card. They don't want a check because they have to chase a check next month. They want a credit card to hook up on file. And I didn't feel comfortable putting our purchase card, you know, every month up, up to that. So, um, so I thought that was a no-brainer. Uh, next one down, insurance. Just as I was talking about workers' compensation, we have the same company called, uh, it's a quasi-governmental organization, partnered with uh, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. It's called KERMA. Um, don't ask me what it stands for. Something with reinsurance. But um, so that's that's again locked in at that three and a half percent contractually obligated rate. Um, but um, Rich, you have a question? Yeah, uh, line two thirty nine, checking indices. What what is that? <clears throat> so uh, this is in the town clerk's vault. Uh, there is a company that comes in. We are contractually obligated or statutorily every year. They have to come in and. Um, Karen Gabble could really speak more eloquently to this. I think they literally just have to check and make sure every every uh, meeting that was had has minutes attached, um, it, and just to make sure everything's there and kind of index the entire vault, like a, like an audit of the vault, to make sure everything's you know properly administered. Oh, okay. Thank um, you. And Karen, if you're watching this later tomorrow, probably, um, if the answer is not what I said, please email Rich Steele. Um, <laughs> so. Because uh, a lot of people watch these me meetings. So, um, all right. So next up, cybersecurity insurance, ten thousand dollars. Working with Dan Cleary, the IT director, placeholder. It, it might be more, it might be less, but that's just an initial, um, an initial investment on the town to get us up to speed to be able to qualify for cybersecurity insurance. So in the event we do qualify and it's more money, um, we'd either come before you or. Or figure out a spot in the budget to, to reallocate <coughs> to actually have cybersecurity insurance. Same with the active ins assailant insurance. Um, there was a few different levels we could pick. This is really assuming we're picking the base level. That's about a million dollars in coverage. Um, but uh, as, as, as we actually apply for these, we, we can keep you guys apprised of what the actual numbers work out to be and have a, have a further conversation there. Um, and then employee assistance, this probably should be recoded to the uh, HR line at some point. This is the um, town's employee assistance program, EAP. You've probably heard that uh, in your, you know, your normal uh, jobs. So that's in this particular line. Um, I've eventually that'll probably work its way into the uh, human resources line. So it is a human resource function. Um, and then just two other things to talk about. Professional development, uh, town-wide. Um, and then, uh, so, so that's if um, the first, this is really the first segment's discretion. If there's a class someone wants to take, if there is a uh, management training that HR wants to put on, that's this little tranche of cash uh, under the uh, authority of the first selectman to spend and have a little more money so that, you know, 67% of the townside budget is uh, wages. Um, and, you know, so this $5,000 can go a long way into training um, management and the staff. Um, if there's a class that comes up, there's not really a place in the budget 
uh, for that to happen. So in the past, we've spent about $2,000 on that line. We have a new HR manager who really is leaning heavily into, um, cl not classes, um, uh, trainings, uh, online trainings, things like that. But that comes with a little bit of a price. Um, so uh, I think this will be money well spent to train the 70% of the operating expense budget. So is that you go, Dan. For morale, uh, you know, it's for town employees to know that uh, there are training opportunities and we're, we're trying to move in the right direction in those areas. So it's, uh, it's important and uh, we're trying to do a little better. So we increase the budget a little bit on that area. That, that's okay. Um, so that that's more generalized training for the, the town rather than distinct training for various departments that would be supplemental to this yeah I, I, you know we do have uh, certain policies you know sexual harassment uh, trainings and uh, um, <clears throat> other areas that are really general for all employees and we don't want to be lax in those areas, so we want to be sure that uh, any of these areas where we really should be um, providing training for our employees, that we have the ability to do that. And uh, again, you know, it's culture. We're trying to create a positive office uh, environment and culture, and part of that is giving trainings in those uh, areas that affect everybody and how they interact with one another. So we're trying to be proactive. Thank you. Um, all right, and then so just jumping to the last one, 245. Uh, SC stands for Southeast Council of Governments. Um, CRED, I'm not sure what that one is. CCM is Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. And then the, thir uh, the fourth one that is also paid out of here is the seat. When you see the buses driving around, that is not free. Uh, the town has to kick in a little bit to that as well. Um, I believe it's like 10,000 maybe. Um, about $8,500, the town kicks into seat. Oh, I'm sorry, $10,684 the town kicks into seat. So when you see those buses driving around, you know, the, all the town subsidizes a small portion of that. So does there any, anyone have any questions regarding 114 general government miscellaneous benefits? No. Nope. I think we're good there. Okay. Let's see that. And then services to community. Section 115. <clears throat> Dan, you want to just do a quick rundown here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, the, the, the first one that we we have a, a, a change in El Beautification was a nine night was a not for profit in town that was um, that did a lot of you know beautification of Main Street, um, some gardens, things like that. Um, one of the individuals that is running that organization, um, no longer doing it. Another individual that took it over, uh, Mr. Dan Shea, um, he's been trying to transition out of it. Um, and so now that it is no longer a 99, it's no longer not for profit. Um, it doesn't appear that there's, um, you know, much interest on that that particular 99, you know, that not for profit side to do things. Um, it sounds like the conversations we've had with Sukumro and the Nayak Main Street organization, they've kind of taken on some of those tasks. The money's actually transitioned from EL Beautification, and the treasurer uh, moved the money into Nayak Main Street's uh, chain of custody. So the, the money, there was about $7,000 left um, accumulated over the course of however long this has been happening. Um, the $7,000 was transferred from EL Beautification into Nayak Main Street. So the, we were told the money is going to be kept separately, and uh, Nanak Main Street is going to do, you know, I think uh, by up, updated garland and things like that to beautify, you know, Main Street. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens with that money. So uh, in the budget, we we uh, reduced that particular line to zero. Um, just going through, not much else has changed. Um, there was a few uh, uh, additions, and then there was also an addition and a subtraction. Um, so the, just getting to the very bottom, 934 Youth Coalition Scholarship. When the first selectman, myself and Sarah Furman, met to go over the first selectman's budget, uh, we moved that money from the Youth and Family Service budget into this budget, just with all the other you know scholarships. And then the Board of Selectmen 
uh, moved it back into youth and family services. So it's not it's not a zero really. We just moved the money back from youth and family services over to uh, service of the community and then back over again. So it's a hot potato, a bit of a hot potato that one. Um, and then the two other ones that were added this year: East Line Police Cadets and Pollinators and Pathways. So. And then, um, so just, and then the other ones that were added last year, Blue Door and Giving Garden, were uh, were added in last budget cycle, as well as the Veterans Rep um, mileage reimbursement that started last year, um, in conversations with the the Veterans Rep. I just have a couple of questions on on just the whole process here. So, when an organization is looking for money, do they each year? So even if we may have given them money in a previous year. Do we wait for a request to come in, and is there a policy behind it that, like, they have to submit the financials or anything else? So, as far as I know, uh, there really hasn't been a process every year. I think initially, when it gets when it, when they got started, uh, there was an amount awarded, and, and uh, looks to me like year to year. They've been given similar amounts, but they haven't had, uh, we haven't really haven't had a situation where they've come in and, uh, you know, like zero-based budgeting where they've justified uh, everything that they receive. So um, it's, it's really just been carried forward for the most part. Because I just, I feel like what went on with the East Line beautification, the money was just building up and nobody really knew that they weren't doing anything anymore. So I'm just, I'm thinking if this is something that we always want to do, it would be good to have the organization, you know, officially request it and with backup on, you know, their financial status and the use of the funds. You know, we did, in our discussions, we did talk about maybe having more of a process than we've had in the past, where, uh, you know, there were some that did attend the meeting and, and uh, uh, advocated for what they received. And most of these are, you know, and we, we viewed as, as worthwhile organizations. Uh, but I think it would be uh, a good policy to, you know, at least have them present you know, spend a few minutes in, fr in front of the, at least the Board of Selectmen and uh, show us what they did with the money and, and what the plan is maybe for the for the next year. Um, and did they spend it all and, or not? Or, you know, what what is the status of it? So, um, yeah, I think that's something we, we could improve on and um, something we might require next time. Yeah. Um, so, as you can see on the screen here, a lot of these organizations did provide request letters or, or some sort of letters of support, and you can see the dates they did. They they came in just as a couple you know a couple weeks ago. Some have came in, and others have came in as early as you know uh, late December, early January. Um, so I, we we try to compile them as best they have. And if anyone sent them and they're not on this list, I apologize. They're sitting somewhere on my desk. Mm -hmm. um, but so so we do get these letters. You know, um, you don't see EL beautification there with a letter. So there are some of them. You know. I will say, you know, as um, the, there appears to be some getting added, but we never really uh, took a look at the, the ones that got, you know, removed any. So I think this this year with the EL beautification, that was a first step mm -hmm. um, in kind of looking at that. But I think there should be some sort of um, uh, structure over this. Um, just speaking, uh, you know, from my perspective on this, you know, some of these are in here because of conversations I've had or I've sent people to the first selectman to talk about. Uh, Brian Burrich, our veterans rep, um, before last year, this account didn't exist. So this gentleman was driving around to the tune of about 20,000 miles in his car a year, um, driving veterans to the VA up in Newington or the VA down in West Haven, I believe it is, um, daily. He's driving these veterans around, bringing them to the grocery store. Um, in conversation with the first selectman, I said, "Hey, you know, I, we're entitled. We, you know, we're required to pay this guy. He's volunteering for us. 
driving around, you know, our veterans. Um, I think we, we, we have an obligation here to kind of kick in some cash here. So every month he supplies a reimbursement form to me. Um, and I think that's also how um, last year, I think the Giving Garden and Blue Door, um, so those three, there was three last year and then there was three this year. So every year it is growing by three, you know, by three. Um, so there, there, there does definitely need to be some structure over this and, and just, you know, some sort of policy, but. Yeah, I think we can do that. The, uh well, I know the the, uh, the, the veterans rep uh, reimbursement. I mean that that's a really important program, and uh, um, Mr. Burge, he you know, drives uh, the veterans to their uh, medical appointments, and there were sometimes there's no other alternative, mm -hmm. um, and it's really a duty that we have, and he does a nice job of it, and he's very diligent with it. So um, it's it's nice to see that uh, he's being uh, reimbursed. And it's my questions right. are really around process because yeah. Yeah. you know this is we're taxing the residents of our town that, right. that you know may not have money and then we're donating it to different. So I, I think it behooves you know this body to make sure that these funds are being you know utilized correctly and, I agree and fairly. Are are um, any of the organizations uh, ones that had received funds through the ARPA um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's definitely there's so, definitely overlap yeah. just uh, without you know looking too deep into the oh, yeah. I, I see one name that pops out of me the two names now so yeah there's definitely a little overlap here yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe dare I use those words ad hoc Yes. Um, but uh, have another have another ad hoc committee, but maybe you know, or we just hash this out before budget season. Actually, we get involved in budget season mm -hmm. and just have a package that we include in the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, we allocate a certain amount of money, um, you know, and then allocate it that yeah. way. So, something to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I had been thinking just along the lines as Denise and. Um, you know, just as stewards for the taxpayers, I, I think it, it's vital that we do have a process in place. And I, I do feel as though an annual application is, is probably warranted, especially since many of these organizations from serving on the ARPA subcommittee with Paul and some of the, the uh, board of selectmen, um, I, I know that some of these also received ARPA money. and. The other thing that, that I notice in, in looking through this, it seems like we've got a range of dollars that we give to some. And, you know, I, I don't know if the public understands the difference why some are receiving 3500 some are receiving 500 some 1000 So I, I think just in, in the, the sake of transparency, as our first selectman has consistently driven home and, and practiced, I, I think that it requires a, a process to be put into place. Anyone have any other questions? On? Okay. <coughs> so then we can move on to um, contingency, and that is 120. I'm just, the computer's a little slower than I am sometimes. <laughs> well, I swear I filled it out. Hold on here. There's multiple versions sometimes, you know? Kills me. Hold on here. Department submitted. First like proposed. I got my budget books ready for next year. That looks better. Okay. So we have uh, four items in our contingency this year. Uh, town payroll contingency, uh, which is uh, the, the majority of that is the non-affiliated uh, group is currently um, discussing increases with 
um, the, a, an ad hoc committee within the Board of Selectmen. Um, I think that is wrapped up or is wrapping up shortly. Um, and so I think uh, either either uh, Mr. Cunningham or a member of that committee will present the recommendation to you guys, um, either at one of the next deliberations, and we can we can go from there. Um, so is there a potential that this number would be fine-tuned before we got to budget adoption? So um, the majority of that number, yes. We, we dropped it from 250 to 200 um, based on some early projections I ran and in discussions with that committee. Um, there will be about, I'm hopeful, about 50,000 left over for unexpected um, uh, position changes, things like that, throughout the course of the year. Um, but, uh, but, but that number could be refined slightly, um, but, but not, a, not anything material, really. Um, so the, the reason why it was 350 last year and it's 250 this year, last year we had three union contracts up for negotiation going into the year. Uh, it was UPSU, fire, and police, I believe, were all still up for negotiation. They weren't settled. So we had to do a um, end of the year. There had to be a um, retro payment and you know budget breakout. So hopefully this year we can do it before we adopt the budget that we don't have to go through that process. So hopefully either tomorrow or Thursday um, we can discuss that breakout and, and talk about that. But um, so, so there's not much to that particular number. Um, does anyone have any questions about that one? Okay. I think it's wrapped up. Pretty yeah. So we should have numbers tomorrow. Very um, uh, Coastal Resiliency Fund. Uh, I think this really uh, uh, exemplified the need for this. When the storm that wall fell down down in McCook's Beach, um, our SP rating agency uh, is asking for this now as well um, to see some uh, effort put forth. Uh, we're a coastal community, um, so they they see us as an elevated risk compared to our non-coastal peers. So this is something really uh, the rating agency wants to see to maintain our current bond rating. Um, so twenty-five thousand dollars would have been enough to patch the wall, like the emergency repairs we did. We're about $25,000, if I'm not mistaken. So our, our thought is here, if something ha like that happens again, we will have, we will have this money set aside. Um, and if we don't spend it, it just builds in that reserve fund um, for something like this to, uh, if something like this happens again. Um, and it's more than just a coast. Here we call it the Coastal Resiliency. I believe it is uh, the formal name. It's Coastal Resiliency and... Um, shoreline protection or something like that because it also a remediation mitigation um, so besides just the resiliency of the coastline it's to build up like you know where houses are and different things so there's we're still working on the ordinance and the language mm -hmm. but um, it's more than just the resiliency of the coastline it's all you know per pertaining to the coastline and the so sea level change. Issues too yeah that going that's what it was yeah no things of that nature yeah um, so related to you know, weather and the tides and Warming. Like an emergency fund, almost, you know. Um, so, uh, and then OPEP can, uh, OPEP trust contribution. Um, ideally, we'd like in the next year to start an OPEP trust. The town has a couple million dollars of liability um, for the other uh, OPEP stands for other post employment benefits. Um, so, you know, things um, uh, retiree health, health insurance, <laughs> things like that that the town is still on the hook for. Uh, but we're right now we're paying as we go. Um, so really, we should set money aside. And then have that grow to kind of contain the liability there on that side, um, and then just so over for the OPEP trust, does this um, ten thousand? Does it include? Would probably need an attorney to set up the actual trust, or um, so this is all encompassing. That this is probably the initial uh, research to pay the attorney. Okay. To, so it's really like you said, research and development of it. Okay. Um, so, and, and the fallback here is whatever. If it's more than ten thousand dollars to establish a trust, we do have the general government uh, legal line mm -hmm. that we can, um, you know, dip into if we have to. Um, on on this um, line four hundred, there's a different number on four hundred on the next page. Is that just a typo? What was the number on the next page? A hundred thousand. That's clearly a typo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just added one extra zero there. I thought Sorry maybe you were that. planning something for the extra 90. Not this year, no. Um, 
I mean, I, so, you know, we have, we have evaluation, the OPEP gets ev evaluated, and they make a determination how much to pay. So, like uh, Ms. Hall was saying, really that 10000 is, um, let's get it established, and then next year we'll come at you with a, uh, a number probably in the $100,000 range to ask for money if I'm a betting man, but we'll see. Um, and then the last, last but not least, uh, the town's actual contingency. Um, you know, the line that we set aside for true emergencies, a quarter of a million dollars, up from the 200000 last year. Um, ideally, I'd like to see that number approach half a percent of the overall budget. Um, so budget is $90 million. That number should be about 450000 The reason we're kind of getting around that, if you look at the last line, this is a contingency section. So all this money is really contingency. So we're above that $450,000. Um, so that's kind of how we, yeah, word uh, plan words there a little. So on most of the other pages in the budget book, we have a 2023 actual expense. Do we have any idea what the actual expenses were for contingency in the past? Um, for 23, uh, when did the wall happen? Well, up in this year, 23, I don't think we spent contingency, uh, from the best of my knowledge, off the top of my head. The 24, we just dipped into it for two things. The wall, the wall that came down, that was 25,000, and I still have to come before you, and uh, if you remember back in the fall, there was a $7,000, there was a, a dock that washed ashore. Yeah. Yeah. That is sitting in Public Works' budget, and sorry, Joe, I know you keep asking me for that money. Because um, he kind of absorbed the seven thousand dollar hit in his in one of his lines, so I, we do have to do a transfer for that as well. To the best of my knowledge, um, I can't think of anything else, Dan. That's the only two things I think. That's that's it. That's the best of my knowledge. Yeah. So far, that's that's our two pain points: the wall and the that's with the ocean. And so, if I remember right, if if the line had funds remaining at the rolls end of that budget year, it rolls into general. Correct. Yep. Okay. All the every line in the general. You know, all these budget versus actual lines, whatever's left rolls into that general fund fund balance. Okay. And historically for the contingency line, have we always been able to roll over? Um, since, since I've been here, yes. If you remember, when I started, I think I mentioned, like, um, one line that was rolled year after year, which I found very odd, which is nothing more than an additional appropriation, um, the first week in July, uh, the prior finance director would come before the boards and ask to, re to, to roll the retirement money, if you remember that. Um, but really, all you're doing is asking for additional appropriation out of your general fund because you can't roll things year over year in an in a annual budgeted account. So the first, first week of the year, you got, you, we were asking for additional appropriation as opposed to just budgeting for it up front. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of a style change, shall yep. you say. Yep. Um, yep. So really, uh, yeah, everything at the end of the year, June 30, everything rolls in the general fund. That's general fund money, obviously. Okay. So, does that kind of answer your yep. question there? Yep. Um, getting into like, you know, rolling, um, we were talking about, you know, what rolls into the general fund or what doesn't. Um, one thing that doesn't roll into the general fund are grants. So, a couple years ago, opioid settlement, uh, the town has received so far to date $123,000 as of this morning, I believe it was. Um, we had a great Friday or Thursday payday. We got like $40 more thousand dollars on Friday. Um, but so, so the grants roll. So now we have established a grant fund. We're going to roll those. They're outside of the. They're going to be outside of the general fund. Currently, we had no place for them before we voted on that that grant fund. So um, it, within the next you know couple weeks. Um, We'll present to you guys a grant fund with grant monies that we've had that were sitting kind of in that general fund. Um, we'll move them into the grant fund so we can better account for them. So I know that was kind of a tangent that was off sides, oh, but just fine. so you had an idea. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyone have any more questions for Kevin on this? Okay. Um, on to 118 finance. Okay, I know you guys have seen this presentation before, um, or, or uh, iteration of this. So um, I'll just I'll 
go through this as quick as I can here. Oh, too fast. Uh, some things that have come out of the finance office since I've uh, started here. Um, Nova time. Uh, last year we rolled out a time and attendance system that the prior uh, HR director and finance director were working on implementing, but just couldn't get it you know, over the finish line. So we went from having carbon copy uh, timesheets to now um, the majority of us, SANS, the police and fire department, are electronic. Uh, we have geofencing capabilities, so when the uh, summer staff for the beach, um, park and rec, or you know, various departments, um, they have to be locked into a certain area within the area to clock in, clock out. Um, on the banking side, we've instituted uh, positive pay on all our bank accounts. Um, a year before I started, uh, the town had about $100,000 uh, stolen due to fraud. Um, we've, we've been ca uh, catching the frauds um, attempts the last couple, you know, the last year and a half now, um, thanks to positive pay. So if no one um, makes a, um, a decision on a particular item, it gets reverted right back. It automatically says, no, we're not going to pay you. So uh, that, that's been nice to, to catch some of the... the, the um, fraudsters out there. Uh, we restructured our bank accounts to utilize zero base, uh, zero balance accounts. So the majority of our funds are sitting in uh, investment uh, investment accounts, earning interest. Uh, purchase cards. Last year we rolled out purchase cards, so all department heads and uh, employees who do purchasing on their department's behalf have a, a state of Connecticut uh, issued J.P. Morgan purchase card, tax exempt. Um, and helps them buy things quicker than the purchase order, invoice, check route. Um, and on top of that, the town gets a 2% reimbursement on whatever we spend. Um, so we don't pay interest, and we're getting a 2% uh, little bump there. Uh, and then the, the big humdinger out of the finance office in collaboration with the Board of Ed is Munis. Um, the, the town's been paying for the software for about seven years. Um, it costs $125,000 a year to run. Um, and it's going to take about 24 months to implement soup to nuts. So we are currently um, about eight months into implementation. We go live July 1, 24, in a couple months. We go live with accounts payable, accounts receivable, um, and general billing. We go live J January 1st, 25, for payroll and HR functions. We go live with utility billing July 1, 25. So this is a three-phase process um, to bring everybody on board with a more robust uh, enterprise uh, resource platform. Anyone have any questions? Um, I just think this is an interesting graph, and I know it's not very fair with what's happened with the Fed um, and the, the sky rising interest rates. But but that's a you know this year we're going to get over a million dollars in interest. Um, I, we didn't sniff a quarter of a million um, in the decade. I could I could go back. Um, ongoing discussions uh, that are kind of spearheaded either from my office or um, my office is a part of. Uh, the Coastal Resiliency Fund, uh, establishing a grant fund check since last time we, we put that here, that, that's been pushed through. Uh, a capital committee, I have a finance intern working on this right now to present to the uh, Board of Selectmen in the next month. Um, and then OPEB Trust. Um, so we're working on uh, bringing some new policies and procedures and uh, updates to the, the finance aspect of the town. Uh, a big thing we do in the finance office is financial statement updates, uh, financial statements. Um, so the last time the town has filed the financial statement on time was 11 years ago. Uh, for the last 11 years, we've asked for ex we've had extensions. Um, some of them as late as seven months um, uh, from the due date. Um, so like 2016 was 13 months past its due date. Um, so uh, currently we are also behind still, um, trying to dig us out of this hole we're in a little bit. Uh, 2021 was approved uh, last March. We are trying to get 2022 out at the end of April, this April. So our auditors have finished their um, field work. Now we're in the review stage and technical review. So hopefully next actual um, regular Board of Finance meeting, we'll have a, a draft for you guys to review, um, ask questions, uh, possibly get the partner in here at the meeting after that uh, for a presentation. So finance staffing, you'll notice my budget has a few drivers in it. One of them is an external accountant. I believe it is either 36,000 or I shaved myself down to 24,000. 
Still 36,000. Gave up all my poker chips. Um, <laughs> so, um, but uh, that, that particular person is an external accountant um, that comes in on Thursdays, Fridays, uh, sometimes works remotely, but is really able to assist me in technical um, year-end close, close-out questions, um, and just give us another set of eyes around the close-out procedures process, um, and just get the audit ready. So um, it's a valuable part of our team that we've added. Uh, in the past, we just kind of paid it out of the uh, deputy finance director line because we had some money left over there. Uh, but now that we actually have to formalize this um, and put and dedicate some resources to this, our idea is to get or our my the finance department's goal is to be in uh, off file on time by uh, fiscal year. We're in 24 now. That's not have a 25. So fiscal year 25, we'll file on time. My goal is to get 24 um, within the three-month extension period. Fiscal year 24, you can file up to March 31st. Um, it is due, uh, it, it's done June 30, obviously. So, um, you know, we've got a few financial statements to get out the door here. Um, that $36,000 from an external accountant um, helps us close that gap a little bit and get the finance office caught up to speed. Will, the, will this um, continue to be there once we're caught up, or is it going to go decrease? Um, so just over the last couple months, um, so we, we, our, our deputy finance director is new. He's been here for uh, four or five months. Um, so between the two of us, we are starting to get traction in the finance office as far as um, the, re the bank reconciliations, tax reconciliations. Um, and just the day-to-day, -day, it's really going back. Like, so we just, we're, we're in the fiscal year 22 audit. I wasn't here for any of that. So when the auditors have a question, what happened here with this? It's gonna, it takes me six hours to, to put a story together for why this number went from 100,000 to 150,000. You know, it's, you know, so it takes a little bit of time right now on the older years. The newer years that we're more familiar with, we know where all the money is. We know, you know, what the problems are, kind of, so to speak. Um, so we're, we've been able to make more traction. I imagine next year um, that line will probably drop down in the neighborhood of 18, twelve to $18,000 to get fiscal 24 out the door. Um, and then by 25, um, we should be in great shape to get rid of that line. So that is my goal is just this temporary, this temporary help um, to get us caught up to speed, build policies, procedures, closing procedures every month every quarter. Um, at the last Board of Select meeting, I think I think it was the Board of Select meeting, I presented a, um, oh, you know where it was? I'm sorry, water and sewer, not on TV. Um, I, I did a standardized report list of every report that will come out of the finance office, um, just so every department has an expectation of what is going to come out of the finance office and post it on the website under that materials tab. We're going to have a materials in the reports tab. So every month you can go on the finance department website and look at you know budget reduction for the general fund or the uh, special revenue fund for the uh, senior center or park and rec. It'll all be there. Um, my goal is to have it the first Friday of the month. So we run disbursements on Thursday, so that I give my AP clerk and my deputy finance director a day to post everything onto the website. So um, so we're hoping to make things more transparent. Um, if anyone has any questions, you know, they can go on the website and, and see what's, you know, what's coming out of the finance office as far as checks and things like that. Yeah. And, and just to say, um, you know, I, I witnessed my first meeting with the state of Connecticut on, on this audit. It was a few days after I was sworn in. And uh, uh, it was, you know, I mean, I didn't know what I was taught. I was there and, and just to, to be there. But uh, uh, I, I really started to get an appreciation of just how big a problem this was for the town. I could just tell by the tone, uh, by the people that were there, that were watching it. And I have to say, um, you know, the credibility that Kevin has with the state of Connecticut, yeah, it's producing all the numbers, but it was that credibility that got us through this without ending up with them putting us on a watch list or, or what, where they would send an auditor down here to really start to monitor what we were doing. Um, we avoided that. And uh, it, it's only because of the guy sitting next to me here, so and his staff. So and, and I and you know, hiring that external uh, accountant to help us with it, they were very happy to see that at the state of Connecticut level. And uh, so I think we're going to get out of harm's way. But um, I want to thank you, Kevin, for 
making that happen. I, I know your deputy finance director's only been here for about seven months, but the concept of a, a central purchasing agent, has that started to get off the starting blocks? So um, when the deputy was hired, um, there was uh, two stipulations. He was working on his CPFO, his uh, Certified Public Finance Officer Certificate, and once he was complete with that, um, he would be working on his purchasing agent uh, certificate. Um, so he we just finished that last month. Um, and so the next thing he's going to work on is the purchasing agent. It takes up to two years to get that. Um, so he's going to start working on that. Um, I, I think by May, I think he was, he gave himself about a month and a half break. Um, and he was going to start firing back up on that in, okay. in May. So yeah, we're hopeful to, to have that become a certified purchasing agent and then uh, centralized purchasing on the town side. Thank you. All right. Oh, that's it. Um, so the only other thing I will add that's not in my PowerPoint slide, um, line 215, is it? 215, the maintenance of office equipment. That line, is, uh, maintenance of office equipment, should really say software. So that is made up of three things. That is made up of... Um, Nova time, our time and attendance, I thought I had that up here, hold on a second. It's Nova time, uh, MCSJ, our current accounting software, and Munis. So like I said before, Munis is about $125,000 a year. Um, I have a breakdown, hold on here. I can't find my breakdown, but um, Munis is um, about $125,000 a year, split between the Board of Ed and the town, roughly 55000 each. And then there's a small portion made up from water and sewer. Um, so really, it's the, the two accounting softwares that the, the town needs for two years while we transition from, from you know, MCSJ to Munis. Um, and then also the... Um, the added fee of Nova Time, which was paid for through ARPA previously. So it's kind of a perfect storm there hitting us all at once. What happens after the two years? Does one of them get eliminated? Uh, yes. So once we are fully integrated and implemented with Munis, we will drop MCSJ. I don't know how that's going to work because, you know, truthfully, we have to maintain data for three years right like you know the records and stuff like that the state of connecticut so uh maybe we keep it for three years and then sunset it after that um or figure out a way to extract all the data from it um i haven't really <clears throat> had conversations on that side of it i was more focused on getting the other side implemented so and i found my breakdown so town for on the town side, Nova Times is twenty-eight thousand dollars, Munis is sixty thousand dollars, and MCSJ is eighteen thousand dollars. So they're um, and, and the only reason we are not paying for Munis from the bond because the town took out a bond for about six hundred and sixty-eight thousand um, dollars. We just ran out of that money uh, last month. So uh, this implementation costs fourteen hundred dollars a day to implement, um, and so the other day we had a fourteen hundred dollar bill come across my desk. I signed it, sent it over to my AP clerk, and she said, "Up, oh, that's the end of that money." So now the the general fund's kicking in the rest. So it's all on. Uh, so before Nova Time was paid from ARPA and Munis was paid for the bond, so now it's all paid for cash, you know, in the general fund. So um, we were paying for it in other places. Now it's you know, in the general fund, so. Anyone have any questions? Well, I'd just like to say that I echo Dan's comments that we're very lucky to have you. I feel like the last couple of years, of, you know, there, there's just, it was understaffed and you know, we didn't have the appropriate people and everybody was working, doing many jobs and, and a lot of things kind of were slipping through the cracks and I appreciate all you've done to tackle everything and doing a great job. Thanks. Anyone 
know, and have, uh, I think the bottom lines aren't worth anything discussing. So shall um, we? Just one thing, Kevin. Okay. When you were talking about the MCSJ, um, maintaining that license for a little while longer mm -hmm. after we make the full transition to Munis, if you did a data mi migration, would the cost of, of a data migration be less than maintaining that MCSJ? So our data is coming over. Like we are migrating three years of data. The problem is we're, we're migrating over the totals, not the detail. Because that was more than whatever the, I mean, that was big time dollars to bring over all the general ledger detail. In doing this also, just so everyone's aware, you see like right now, like line 111's treasurer. Going forward, when we switch to, to Munis, you're not going to recognize any of the account numbers. You know, treasurer might be 51610. They're going to be five digits, not three digits. So it's going to be a completely new uniform chart of accounts. So my deputy finance director for the last couple of weeks has been mapping out the 1,800 accounts we have in our general, in our, uh, in our accounting software now, mapping them to new accounts that are approved by the state of Connecticut. So that's his, one of his biggest tasks right now is to go account by account and map them both out. So um, once we get that done, it you know it, it shouldn't be more, we shouldn't really need that old accounting system um, past January first, twenty twenty five, because we're still running payroll. We're running parallel two accounting systems for six months, so that'll be a fun little task. Novatime go away. Novatime does not go away. Novatime is time in attendance. So Novatime is the punch in, punch out. And then that information imports into MCSJ or Nova Time, or, uh, and uh, um, MCSJ or Munis, right? Depending on which bridge we pick. But um, so that those will still be. We'll still need at least two softwares any given time. Okay. So thanks. Any other questions? All right. Move on to Ford Finance. And biggest issue here is just the auditing services I think everything yeah. else is a pretty um, pretty small numbers yeah so the only one we have to talk about is hold on I don't know what just happened to my there it is uh, the only thing here um, the audit fees themselves there's only about five auditors in the entire state of Connecticut that do uh, municipalities um, the one we have, CLA, um, formerly Boom Shapiro. Um, uh, so we have a new audit partner. We had Ron Nosick, you probably remember from a couple years ago. He retired. Um, CLA has a mandatory retirement age. Um, and so now we have Nicoletta, Mick, uh, Nicoletta M. Um, and uh, about a month after she started, and Ron sent me over his quote for the audit of about $60,000. She said, here's the new quote. It was $80,500. And I forwarded Ron's quote to her saying, hey, I got this three weeks ago. And she said, I'm your partner now. Here's the new quote. So, um, and, and I called around uh, to some other accounting firms, the one that I previously used in Brookfield, and no one even had appetite to touch it. Um, just with the, uh, the shortness in staff accountants. So um, I think for fiscal year 24 five, um, the eighty thousand dollars is is um, is probably a good number. Um, the, I've reached out to a few other finance directors in the state of Connecticut, um, and I had an article somewhere, um, and I think it was fifty percent on average uh, audit fees are going up um, based on the uh, CCM data. So uh, we're we're they, in line. And they won't budge. Uh, they, won't. they were they were willing to budge one way. <laughs> Um, not the way I, I needed them to go, so. But, but you've got sixty-five five. Because the board of ed kicks in fifteen thousand. Okay. Board of ed kicks in money for uh, EFS. So that's their portion of it. Okay. So. So the total is there. Total is eighty thousand five hundred. General fund side sixty-five five. Um, and. We're, I'm hoping that's locked in. But. Okay. Kind, of, kind of at their mercy a little bit. Any other 
questions for Kevin on that? All right, so now we are moving on to Parks and Rec uh, 421. And I believe we have Jerry coming up to the. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could just state your name and address when you get up there. Thank you. Good evening, Jerry Locke and Parks and Rec Director. Uh, it's my second time through the budget process, so um, just looking at the, the, the summary I just uh, sent out or handed out to you, I just wanted to go through that briefly just to make sure everybody kind of understands the scope of what happens in Parks and Rec, and then we can uh, delve into any questions that you might have. So the first statement at the top there is Parks and Rec contributes to the, val the quality of life in the community. Everything that we do in, in Parks and Rec touches people in some way, whether it's somebody at the beach, somebody at uh, a park playing a ball game, uh, talking about building a dog park or what have you. We're, that's us. That's us in the community center, us at Celebrate East Slime. That's us at concerts on the beach. So. Um, with our budget, we, we have kind of three primary funding mechanisms that we use. The first is a general fund, and that funds our, um, our Parks and Rec staff, our full-time staff, and our parks operation. The special revenue fund is a separate fund that's funded by fees that people pay. So that is, doesn't impact the tax rate, and that's not something we'll be you know, discussing here tonight, but uh, the fees that people pay for Parks and Rec programs pay for Parks and Rec programs. The people that uh, pay a fee to attend uh, or park a car at the beach pays for the lifeguards at the beach. So that's that's kind of a, a wash. I will say that COVID um, had a very detrimental impact on the, um, the sustainability of the special revenue fund. We had expenses that we were paying and a lot of people were doing a lot less. So a lot less money coming in and still having expenses um, caused us to use up uh, a great deal of our fund balance. And as our finance director will tell you that you probably want somewhere around a 10%, is that right, Kevin? 10% of your fund balance to, for, of your operations in fund balance? 17, guys. 17, 17. okay. So it's even higher. Cool. So, you know, if you figure our uh, special revenue fund budget, you know, is somewhere between half a million and a million dollars, we want a fund balance somewhere around you know, close to $100,000. And right now we're, we're more, we're closer to twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 than we are to one hundred. dollars So that's, that's, a, that's a challenge for us over the coming years to build that fund balance, to make sure that that fund stays sustainable, that we can be ensured that we have operations at the beach and, and whatnot. And then the final thing is, obviously, with Parks and Rec, we, we, we own and operate parks. And, and there are capital investments that we need to uh, maintain those parks in terms of equipment or in terms of projects that we do at those parks. So with that, um, just to go through them one by one, the general fund, um, we do have a modest increase in our, our general fund budget this year. And it's primarily due to uh, maintenance seasonal labor and things to maintain those parks. Um, we did request um, an additional full-time staff member and we did request even more um, money to help maintain those parks, some of, some of which are, um, our duties are growing. They're not, they're not diminishing. We're doing more and more in terms of uh, maintaining uh, parks that aren't even, our properties that aren't even parks, things like Town Hall, things like Nyanic Main Street, things like uh, the public safety building or the, um, the Smith House or Brookside Farm. Those are properties that we help maintain, but that are not necessarily in the park and rec, um, you know, are, 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 are in our circle of responsibility. So our duties are growing and we were requesting some additional support to do that. Um, the first selectman and the um, board of selectmen approved modest increases, not quite what we were asking, but they did uh, approve modest increases in those, in those areas. And I guess, go ahead. Just 
So um, what services do you perform like here at Town Hall or Public Safety? Just so uh, mowing the grass, uh, taking care of the, you know, uh, leaves and, you know, collecting trash, that kind of stuff that, that we do. Yeah, just maintaining those properties. We're, we're in the, you know, we're in the, we're in a really good position to do that. It's just that, you know, it's, it's just an additional duty on top of what we normally do in terms of maintaining uh, Perrette's Park at Bridebrook or McCook Point Park or Cheney Beach or what have you. All right, and uh, so just to uh, quickly, I'll go through the, the list of, of capital projects that we have. Um, we've heard the McCook Seawall a couple times tonight. The, the um, seawall was obviously destroyed by uh, some coastal storms and needs to be replaced. So there is a, uh, a, an amount in the budget, I think $400,000, to replace the McCook Seawall. That will be done following the uh, season. That will not be done before this, this upcoming summer. We would wait until after the summer uh, peak use is over, and then we would go to repair it to be ready for the next fall and winter storms. Um, there is a uh, request for a um, beach erosion plan. Um, even even before the, the storm that took out the seawall, we had three significant erosion events at uh, between November and January at, uh, at McCook and Hole in the Wall, where yards and yards and hundreds of yards of sand was eroded out into the sound, and fortunately a lot of it came back, but there is significant erosion that's happening at at McCook's and, and it, as you know McCook's is, is a hill and the water rains on top and it runs down and it just follows these uh, paths and just you know we, we need to do something to control that to preserve that that park and what we need to do is that the money that uh, we would be spending on this plan would tell us what we need to do so we would be coming back probably next year with a request to actually implement whatever plan that was to, to, you know, to whether it's landscaping or, you know, some kind of design work that we would do to uh, mitigate that, that continual erosion that we have. And at um, Perrette's Park um, at Brightbrook, we had a couple of, of, of projects that we requested and working with the first selectmen, um, we've decided to reallocate some uh, ARPA funds that are left over from projects that we had that uh, to fund those projects instead, and I guess you'll see them up there. There, those are the are they? Yeah, they're in yellow. Are are some examples of things that we're going to use ARPA funds to uh, fund those projects instead of budgeting capital money to do that. So um, rather that they are they are being cut from the the general fund budget, but they will be funded with, funded with leftover ARPA funds, if that makes sense. And the same with oh, sure. Yeah, so, so which projects were those ARPA funds originally intended so, for? So, uh, great question. We have um, an ARPA project for uh, the restrooms at a Hole in the Wall uh, that we, we've made those year-round restrooms. There was funds left over from that, so we're using some of those funds to do those projects. And also there was a, a, a small amount of money left over from a playscape uh, and park and playscape repa uh, replacement mm -hmm. that... Uh, that's left over, so. Okay. I, yes? I noticed on, on that slide a minute ago that the amount of money to repair the seawall and the cook was way less than what we were originally told. Um, is that because it's being spread um, out over several the, years? Or? The, the amount of money is actually more than we thought it was. Uh, the department requested 300000 and the Board of Selectmen adjusted it up okay. 100000 to make it 400000 So, yeah, unfortunately, that is, not a, that is not less. That's actually more, and that's a, that's a, 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 bitter, a bitter pill to swallow there. Um, also, um, I, folks, and I, I, I guess I, I'm going to take a minute here to recognize Todd Donovan. He's one of our Parks and Rec commissioners here in the room. And also Ben Armstrong is another one of our Park and Rec commissioners. But what reminded me was uh, Todd Donovan was the chair of our Darrell Pond subcommittee. So you'll notice that uh, the Darrell Pond subcommittee did a great deal of work and they completed a master plan for the Darrell Pond property. And they divided it up into two phases of work to do, you know, phase one we'll, we'll try to complete and phase two will come later. Um, we did request funding for a number of the phase one um, 
initiatives and, and we even broke that down further. So we've decided to pursue a recreation trails grant for $350,000 um, to take that out of the general fund and hopefully we'll get state funding to do that. So that would be a huge uh, windfall if we, if we got funding to do that, that trail. Um, and then we did take out a couple of our um, smaller phase one projects, the uh, water sampling station and the aquatic education center. But what still remains are two of the higher uh, priority initiatives at Darrow Pond, and that is the disc golf course and the, uh, the, the signage that we'll use to educate people and kind of help wayfinding at Darrow Pond. So uh, a relatively small investment of $50,000 there at Darrow Pond to begin to implement the master plan that uh, the Darrow Pond subcommittee did a, did a great job of completing over the course of about two years. And then um, we also have um, what I added as a park improvement program. There are a lot of smaller items at parks that need to be um, addressed. You know, it could be uh, replacing grills at McCook Point Park or uh, purchasing soccer goals for uh, the fields or putting a fence up at the football field. There's all kinds of these just little little things that we need to kind of maintain and, and continually uh, upgrade to our, our parks to keep them usable and relevant. So um, the, the amount that I requested was $50,000. And again, this was something that the Board of Selectmen chose to, or in fact, actually this case was the first Selectmen chose to cut that in half. But, but again, we're going to use some leftover money from the, the ARPA funds to kind of subsidize the other half of this. And, and, and we do expect to do $50,000 worth of capital improvements. It's just that half is coming from capital and half is coming from ARPA. And then all the other uh, uh, items we have up there um, are vehicles. And the, the vehicles we have are all uh, replacement vehicles. We did request a new vehicle in the... Uh, in the budget, but uh, that was cut at the first selectman's review. So all of the vehicles that are that are still in the budget are replacement vehicles. Um, our park staff did a great job of going through all of our vehicles, and um, we have a, a you know a ten-year plan to replace all of the tractors and mowers and pickups and dump trucks and things like that that um, our park staff uses. So um, you can see all those vehicles there. Uh, yeah, a, a pickup truck, a, a landscape trailer, um, a workman type vehicle, and a ATV for emergencies at the beach. Jerry, can I say one thing here? Um, the vehicle, uh, the beach, uh, the vehicle for the beach staff. <clears throat> um, there's really only one vehicle. Um, uh, never mind. I was going to say there's one vehicle added to the fleet, but it's not even being added. Uh, one kind of work around we did. Uh, Deputy Fire Marshal vehicle for seventy-five thousand dollars. He currently drives a two thousand and it's either two thousand six or two thousand eight Ford Expedition. It's a big red uh, uh, SUV. You've probably seen zipping around town with lights on it. Um, so that is the Deputy Fire Marshal's last fire chief. While um, we don't believe the car's um, ha has enough reliability to be a first responder vehicle, um, we, we thought it had enough useful life to be repurposed as a seasonal vehicle for the beach and summer staff um, right. to throw some, uh, you know, throw the stuff in the back of it, drive it a mile down to the beach, hopefully it gets there. Um, that would be great. So that, that, would that be is fabulous. our plan there. So while it is not a, you know, a new car, um, our idea is to repurpose uh, the vehicle with whatever useful life it has left and move it over to, uh, to Park and Rec so the seasonal staff has a way to get from the central office to the beach and the parks okay and I guess with that on the on the back side of your sheet of paper there's a, a list of prior cuts and we've kind of talked about those and also a, a, a ten-year plan so um, you know the the ten-year plan deals mostly with um, park and rec projects that we expect to be coming up so improvements to uh, Perez Park at Brybrook Darrow Pond uh, the McCook uh, improvements and uh, Things, community center, things like that, that I'm sure we'll be hearing more and more about as uh, as we go through future budget years. And with that, you know, if, I, I know you have the detailed uh, look of our budget in your in front of you, so I'm happy to respond to any particular questions about whatever happened to the tent up at uh, McCook's. 
The the tent at McCooks. Um, that it's was a special yeah, revenue fund. Right? Yep, yep. That that is that a. Uh, it didn't last very long. That that's correct. Yeah, the tent the tent was destroyed by wind, and um, the the cost to replace it is uh, about fifteen thousand dollars. And as I mentioned, you know the the beach operations are part of the special revenue fund. Mm -hmm. um, it is a high priority item for the Parks and Rec Commission, and we'd love to replace that tent. Um, but the, you know. It's, it's do we want to replace the tent or build that fund balance to a sustainable amount? So we kind of have that kind of uh, discussion that's happening and we're trying to work through that and, and find ways to to replace that tent. It was used and it was a service to the community and people liked it. So, you know, I mean, that's obviously something that we would love to get back. Did your revenue take a hit once it was gone? Or um, yeah, there was a, a yeah, a, it does reduce our revenue a bit. Um, you know, the, it, the payback on buying a tent, $15,000, um, would be several years of, of rentals to pay that $15,000 back. I noticed the uh, non-union payroll went down significantly. Is that um, permanent or temporary, and how did you do that? That is a, uh, it, it's, it's a shift from non-union payroll to the, um, I think the clerical line item. So it's just a reclassification of a position from one to the other. So it's it's just a, a straight shift. It's not a it's not any change in our staffing plan at all. So it went to the three eleven. Yep. Could you uh, talk about the different? Um, Dues and professional organizations. Um, yeah, I see that line item going up 38%. I don't see it's a lot, but yeah. when I read about them, it seemed like they were all very similar. So, yeah, there are um, several um, organizations that uh, our Parks and Rec staff belong to. Uh, the primary one is, well, there's two primary ones. One is the National Recreation and Park Association that um, obviously governs our, our profession across the country. Uh, we have a state affiliation also. That's the Connecticut Recreation and Park Association that we, we and we actually pay dues to both. Um, the, the national um, agency obviously has a, a, a broader focus. Um, Connecticut is, is invaluable to us. We, we maintain uh, direct communication with our state association throughout the year, uh, go to trainings at uh, conferences and quarterly meetings. Our local park and rec professionals uh, meet monthly here in southeastern Connecticut. So, you know, what happens in one town and, and we work through those problems. So that's a, a bit of what goes on. There's also a, a Connecticut Park Association, and that's more... Um, uh, I would say park focused. The Connecticut Recreation and Park Association obviously deals with the special events and the programs and things like that. But the Connecticut Park Association is trees and bushes and grass and beaches and you know like the, that type of thing. So that's kind of the difference between the uh, the different organizations. And did you add on another organization? Um, no, I don't think we added on a, an additional organization. It would be that um, we just have, you know, it's the, the dues are set by those organizations and whatever they quote us the next year's prices are, that's what we would include in there. Supplies going to be one-time purchases, or is this an ongoing? I think I see it. Email me, Adobe. So miscellaneous supplies, and, and I, you know, I, I heard Kevin talking about Munis, and oh my God, I, I can't wait for Munis to show up. Um, but miscellaneous supplies in parks and rec terms means a lot of different things, including software. And software for us is is <coughs> changing, and we have uh, a need to, you know, utilize more and more technology in in our in our operations so unfortunately it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer but if you look at um, most of the items listed under you know Adobe rec desk um, those kinds of things email me form survey monkey those are technologies that we would depend on that we need to pay and, and in our budget it, it's called supplies 
yeah, or it's, it falls under supplies. I think in our next budget under Munis, it'll probably be a, uh, a different <laughs> account code for that, that we would, you know, um, that number is going to mean, uh, you know, software and technology across all departments. Also, I noticed on um, the park and field maintenance that um, for restroom cleaning, there was not a number in there for 25. And it looks yeah, like, it looks um, like it could be a lot. Um, restroom cleaning is is uh, something that we have a choice of two ways to 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 operate. One is to pay s seasonal staff to clean the restrooms, or the other is to hire our contractual staff. So, if we were going to hire hire employees, it would be um, under seasonal, uh, which is where we have it. And here you can see there was there was there was an amount that was uh, projected, but we're doing it. Um, as a as an employee, there you see Kevin's got it highlighted there, 8194 a restroom cleaning versus paying somebody contractual for several months to do it. For the, the professional conferences and conventions, yeah. the six by fifty and the four by four hundred, is that Six by six 50 would be people. six people attending a kind of a quarterly meeting for $50 each, and four by 400 is four uh, professional staff members attending a conference, uh, a, an annual conference, a multi day event for 400. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Jerry? Denise, just so you have it, um, I just wanted to show everyone what the special revenue fund had for a fund balance. The entire fund has $77,000 roughly. Uh, Park and Rec side, about 25000 Toots stands for Theater Under the Shell, which doesn't have a home currently. Jerry, we'll talk to you later. Um, and then Commission on Aging has $22,000. So um, so there's, there's multiple... Th even though it says Park and Rec Special Revenue Fund, there's really you know a couple different um, cost centers, you shall, shall you say, in there. Um, so Park and Rec yeah. has about twenty five thousand as of six thirty twenty three. So just so everyone knows what, what what's in that fund. So I was just generally speaking, not specific to your budget, but it just seemed to me that maintenance of the building grounds sounds like it would be something that should be captured in public works are we it just it seems like a, a very so desperate yeah the job the um, job skills that you know are are required to maintain landscaping you know it's it's probably something that public works could do but public works you know their major um you know operations their their highway department maintains you know roads and streets and you know um you know, ma maintaining and manicuring a, you know, a building is, is kind of a different skill set and it involves different tools and, and whatnot. Not that Public Works doesn't have a, a string trimmer or something that they have when they need it, but, you know, we've got guys who are, you know, driving uh, pickups with the trailers full of the equipment that you need from place to place to place. And in terms of the town's operation, it makes a lot of sense to have guys that are skilled doing that, you know, you know, do you want somebody who's normally paving a street to come over and change jobs and kind of start mowing lawns, or do you want to just, you know, have have the people doing what they're good at and what they're trained to do and what their equipment is lined up to do? It's it's a matter of efficiency, I think, and that's the reason we do it. We're happy to do it. I just, you know, I'm, the reason I throw that out there is just to kind of educate people that you know we're not only just dealing with parks; we're dealing with a lot of other properties, and and that's kind of where the struggle comes from. You know, when I go to the first selectman, I'm, he's, he's asking me, well, why do you need a new staff member? Well, we need a new staff member because, you know, we have all these things to do. But so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of balance. We're doing it because we're, we're good at doing it. And, you know, I, I trust that at some point the, the budget's going to, you know, uh, give us, you know, the adequate resources to do that effectively. And it's better than the alternative. You know, if you're going to ship that over to, to Public Works, you know, I, I don't think they would be happy, we wouldn't be happy, and, you know, uh, the town hall wouldn't be happy. Uh, uh, along that line, um, 
Which department is responsible for maintenance of the boardwalk? Is that yours? That is us. We we uh, maintain the boardwalk, the the day to day maintenance. You know, uh, there are um, in 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 the public works department, they have engineers and you know uh, people that that are experts in building things. So if it's if it's some, a matter of building something or fixing something, it could be that public works is involved. But in terms of keeping the um, you know the boardwalk. Uh, shovel during the winter or picking up trash or keeping the weeds down or whatever that's us yep okay and if I remember right I, I thought there was some money that was allocated because of the East Lyme Foundation or, or, or some organization wanted this was during ARPA times and during the pandemic wanted some maintenance of the boardwalk because it seemed like it was developing cracks and such and walking there recently it seems right I, I think I saw that email come weeds. around uh, in fact Before today it. today uh, I think there was it uh, was I right was it seventy thousand dollars Kevin um, I'm looking now you're saying it's an ARPA uh, I, I don't know that it was ARPA but I, I know it that we've ARPA. talked about it in our yeah, weekly meetings with public works about crack repair at the boardwalk there were um, some <clears throat> funds that were approved uh, probably two or three years ago and it may have been ARPA related or you know it may just have been a capital project but yeah that that is a project that portion of the project would be um, kind of directed by public works to kind of repair some kind of a structural thing with the boardwalk that that's in their ballpark not not necessarily ours and and that fund exists and and trying to uh, figure out in fact I have a meeting tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock with them and I'd be happy to um, bring that up again and, and send an, an update to uh, Kevin and Dan and they can share it with you as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I just hope that the projects that you're utilizing ARPA funds for aren't being taken from the maintenance of the boardwalk. It, it they are not. Need some they work. are not. Yeah. No. So, um, w with the exception of one of those ARPA projects, the other projects will have to be reapproved. So we'll close them out and reapprove them. The only one that's going to be uh, an extension of a current project is the re the septic. At, at Pretz Park, is it? Yep. Brook? Or, mm -hmm. yep. um, the, the name of the project is Sewer and Bathrooms. Right. We're putting a septic in. I think that's close enough. Um, so, but, um, so that's, that's the one we're going to slide that in there. Any leftover money will be used, will be closed out, and then reappropriated, you know, all board selectmen approved, um, to the field renovations yep. line. Okay. So, and I, there is 70,000. NBB concrete repairs, something boardwalk, concrete repairs, 70,000 in there. So. Will, will there be any uh, additional maintenance of the new land that the town just bought? Are we going to see a bigger budget next year for maintaining that, or is there? That's a that's a great question for the first selectman. Um, you know, that that's a, a point of discussion that we've had about, um, you know, that there probably should be some place in the budget to to provide resources to maintain open spaces that the town owns. It is not a part of park and rec um, responsibilities. Um, not that we wouldn't step in and, and help out if, if needed, but there are, you know, there are trails, there are, you know, sometimes dangerous trees, sometimes there's, you know, something happens uh, on these open spaces that needs attention. And yeah, currently the town does not have uh, a fund that I'm aware of to kind of help maintain that open space. So. In answer to your question, there certainly isn't in Parks and Rec, and I think that's probably something that, you know, uh, that we would would benefit the town to do moving forward. Yeah, I can I can address that. So there were three um, parcels, generally uh, areas that were purchased. One uh, is the Osagachi Hills uh, network, um, and that's. Uh, that's being maintained the way the way it always was, and uh, I think the friends of Oscratchy Hills do some trail maintenance up there. Um, I'm not sure how much Parks and Rec does, other than right at the the front end of it where the parking lot is and the baseball field is. But the the trails themselves um, uh, are, I think, some of the volunteers, uh, the Boy Scouts, and others. Uh, front, they take care of the the trails, and it really isn't that much to do up on the trails. So they're walked on and there's pathways but it's really where you 
you know, start the trail where there's some infrastructure that the town is responsible for. Uh, the other one is the Ravenswood area. Um, I think there's a, there's a parking area at one at either end of the trailhead. Um, so there's some minimal amount that the, I think the town does just to, you know, oversee those uh, parking areas. There's a little stand where there's some, you know, uh, information about the trail or a map. But it really isn't uh, anything intensive. As far as I know, Jerry, is that right that the town does on those? Yeah, th that would be just very minimal stuff. Very minimal. Um, the larger track up near Hathaway, uh, the Hathaway Farm track, um, we're re really not planning at this point in doing anything other than owning it and getting it conserved with conservation easements. Uh, there are you know, some trails through it, but it, we're, it's, it is open space and you know, the town owns it if someone wanted to walk in the woods up there, but there, there are no improvements right now and we're not contem contemplating any at, at the present time. So the main thing was just to get title to it and protect it. I, I guess, Dan, I would add one other piece to that, and, and Darrow Pond. Darrow Pond is actually 300 acres. The town parks and rec department uh, manages 100 of those 300 acres. So there's a, a part of Darrow Pond that we actually have responsibility to maintain, but there's another additional 200 acres out there that we don't. So, um, you know, it, it's just another open space where people are, you know, the Goodwin Trail go, runs right through it and, and whatnot. So people are using these these properties and again long term I think it's it's in our best interest to kind of develop a plan to you know uh, to provide resources to maintain them appropriately any other questions no? thank you very much thank you and now on to 425 Family Services. Thank you. Sarah, you're going to? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, you get a new one, right? Yes. Okay. You want the mouse? Sure. I'm Sarah Furman, Director of Youth and Family Services. So, uh, Youth Services was under the Park and Rec Department. Then in November of this last year, we became our own department and we are now Youth and Family Services. Our mission statement stayed the same. The only thing that we changed was to offer more services to people of all ages. For our, our operating budget, some of our funds just shifted over from Park and Rec into Youth and Family Services. Under the general fund, we asked for a full-time wellness and prevention mentoring coordinator, but we were approved for a part-time wellness and prevention mentoring coordinator. And then also 25% of the senior center's social worker salary. And that can be found under line item 311. We also moved our open center staff from the special revenue budget up to the operating budget of the general fund. Um, the special revenue has not been sustained in itself. So after meeting with Kevin and Dan, we decided it would make more sense to move it up to the general fund and then we also have under the general fund a part-time licensed therapist right now she is under ARPA funds which runs out June 30th so she will move over to the general fund um, she has since she started in March of 2022 has received 44 referrals and she has been able to provide services to 24 of those referrals that we received. The other half either went without services, sought services elsewhere, or moved out of state. 
And then also to bring up the revenue under the special revenue fund, we plan on offering fundraising events and additional programs. One new program that we start, started offering is Kids Night, and we've offered that twice now, and that has been very successful. So our goals and objectives obviously are to have a fully staffed department. So that would be a full-time wellness and prevention mentoring coordinator, two part-time licensed therapists, a full-time case manager, social worker, and also a full-time administrative assistant. We hope to be able to provide access to state resources. Right now, we're not able to do that. I have to refer out to other local agencies or rely on our family resource liaison to help with those referrals or also you know, utilize our senior center social worker to help. And then we would like to continue to provide access to support groups. We offer Girl Circle. We have a grandparents raise in grandchildren support group. I'd like to start offering a boys council. We have youth programs. We have an after school open center program that's offered to our middle school students. We also offer a youth coalition, which we have student representatives that sit around the table with different stakeholders from the community. And we work on increasing awareness and education on different substance abuse, mental health, suicide prevention initiatives. We have substance abuse and prevention and education that we provide. Um, we collaborate with different organizations in town. We work very closely with the police department and the schools to offer parents and youth, you know, access to different preventative um, courses and initiatives. And then we have our part-time therapist to help provide the clinical mental health piece. And then access to family resources, providing parent education classes. And then we are dedicated to providing East Lyme and Salem residents access and assistance with resources and services that target community outreach, social services, and youth services. We recognize that with this small budget, we're not going to be able to meet all the needs of our community. We also cover Salem. So we plan on holding different fundraising events, looking into different grants that are available, and offering different youth programs to help bring in that additional revenue. Any questions? So if you're also covering Salem, are they participating in? I offer, yeah. Every time I offer like a youth program, um, the support groups, they're able to come and participate. But financially, is the financially, yes. Um, if they needed access to the, you know, therapy, they would be able to seek that service out. I, I think what you're asking does Salem contribute any to this? So we yeah. get um, a local prevention council grant, and yes. That grant money that is allocated for Salem, I have to get permission from the first selectmen to be able to have access to those funds to provide services up to Salem. And then we also get a state grant through DCF that allows us to provide services as well. Yes. I'm interested in how you interact with the school system um, because I looking at their budget it seems like some of the stuff that you're doing they're also doing um, how does that work so that uh, things are not duplicated unnecessarily so i can say that the school counselors are very overwhelmed with the cases that they've seen and they are not able to provide that outside resource after the school hours so that's where they rely on you know youth and family services to step in to provide those services that a youth or a family may need um, I work very closely with the schools with a mentoring program. So we have adult mentors that go into the school and mentor students that have been identified by either their parents or by their school counselors that would benefit from having a mentor to meet with them on a weekly basis. 
Um, and then I'm working with our assistant superintendent right now to offer a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program, which allows our high school students to go down and mentor eighth graders to kind of help them transition over to the high school. And then eventually our future plan is to have, you know, that go down to the elementary level as well. Um, we come together to offer different parental education classes. We offered Screenagers, which was a movie about growing up in the digital world and how it affects youth mental health. So we partner on different events throughout the school year, you know, together. Yes. So uh, along the topic you just brought up about parental education, uh, aside from the screening of, of Screenagers, which that, that was a very excellent the poorly attended event. It was, yes. Um, I, I was disappointed with the attendance, but the, the content was superior. So, so kudos for that. Um, what do you have in terms of parent education, parent support groups within the, your, your department? The only support group that we offer right now in a parental role is for our grandparents that are helping raise their grandchildren. I would like to offer more parental support groups um, around substance abuse, mental health. I've been working closely with Ann Daigle about offering a community conversation forum where, you know, monthly community members come together and we could talk about different mental health services and needs that the community is struggling with. Um, yeah, along those lines, we don't have the resources right now to offer additional groups for parents. I have set up different events at night and again we run into the problem of it being poorly attended by our parents. The ones that show up really aren't the parents that should be there because they are looking to provide those additional resources and services and help to their kids. Um, we've offered virtual events in person and again the attendance has been low. So we're working with um, myself and our assistant superintendent with somebody to help us around family engagement and how can we increase that attendance? What should our tar target audience be? You know, should we partner more with the PTA and have them work with us to get those families in? Um, do we go to school events? I've gone to football games and set up a table to kind of, you know, go to that target audience. Um, just finding ways that are really going to be able to get the message out there where the families and youth are going to be. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, when you started with your discussion of the parental education, you immediately went to the, the mental health and mm -hmm. drug abuse and da 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 da. But it, it seems as though what's going on with the schools, just your everyday parent is dealing with a lot, especially with kind of making up for the effects that the pandemic had upon kids. And, you know, I, I don't know how much you do with the library as well, because you're all kind of totally located there. Yeah, so I recently sat down with Lisa and Chris, and we talked about how we can partner more together and offer different, you know, classes for our youth, whether it's preschool age or you know, elementary, middle school, high school. So we've talked about different things that we can partner on to kind of target that audience. Um, you, on the handout, you have asterisks uh, next to some of the social services, just but you didn't explain what the asterisk was. Because we don't offer that right now. Okay. Yeah, that is one thing that we're lacking. We don't provide social service um, support. That is something that I would like us to do in the future. So really relying now on our social worker who, you know, a quarter of her time will be in youth and family to really help those families that are struggling with the different social services needs, whether it's employment, renter's rebate, housing, um, financial aid, food assistance, really working together to help that out. So how to get access. Correct, yes. <clears throat> on your fundraising, what do you have for goals as far as how much you're going to be able to uh, fundraise? Um, so 
we kind of broke it down. Let me just find. So this is our third year that we've been offering National Night Out. It's been a very successful family-friendly event that I collaborate with the police department on. Um, we're hoping to bring in $2,000 for that. Our big one that we're looking to do is a golf tournament, so we have formed a subcommittee to start planning that, looking for maybe the end of this year, maybe spring of next year, and hoping to bring in around 8000 And then a talent show. We offered a talent show in the winter, but we didn't have many youth sign up for it. Um, so we're going to try to figure out a different time of year that might get that engagement up and try to bring in a thousand dollars for that. All right. The other question is, uh, when you were split off from uh, Park and Rec, mm -hmm. uh, some of the services that you have were uh, done by Park and Rec. Now there was a cost to that to the Park and Rec <clears throat> when you established this new department. How much uh, over? Are you, is it going to cost the town to keep this uh, department up and running? The only new money that's coming <coughs> is my position as director, um, and then to have a quarter of the social worker in my salary. I, prior to me becoming director, I was a full-time prevention and wellness coordinator, so that's been cut down to part-time, so they're going to be saving money on that. Um, the Open Center staff has always been a part of you know, park and rec under their budget. It's just moving over now to my budget. So that's not new money. Um, and then the counselor, she was covered under ARPA, and now she's moving to the general fund. So that's going to be additional money. Now, those people that were working for park and rec providing those services, are they, when you switch the funds over to your department, are the people coming over and working in your department? They're not working for park and rec anymore. Right, that is correct. They're going to be under youth and family. Sarah, can I jump in here real yeah, quick? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, John, I think your question is, like, are we going to see any savings in park and rec? Right? Is that kind of what the, uh, you're well, getting at a little? that's part of that. Okay, so let me just answer that question because I think that's what I was, um, I think that we're getting down. So let me just pull up real quick. I had up Fund 18. When we were talking about Fund 18, right, where park and rec special revenue fund is, and how this is broken down is each cost center has its own, you know, income statement, right? P and L, profit and loss. So every year, you know, so this is 2012. Adult services brought in uh, $17,000 of income. What does this do cumulatively? So if we look down here, the youth service part of the park and rec budget has a draw of $194,000 negative. So every year, last year, it pulled $44,000 more than it spent. The year before that, it pulled $28,000. The year before that, twelve. The year before that, twenty-eight. So when we were talking about the open center staff, the open center staff is paid for out of the Park and Rec Special Revenue Fund, not with taxpayer dollars. So all the other funds, so when we look at, you know, um, let's just pull a year randomly, 2022. We look at 2022. Here's Park and Rec's profit and loss. So for 2022... Park and Rec as a whole profited $2,500. Well, Youth Services pulled the fund down 28000 So if this was zero, if they were self-sustaining, Park and Rec would have had a $30,000 income that year in that line. So, so really, Park and Rec is sustaining this Youth and Services in, the, in, a, in a separate fund outside of the general fund. So, um, I mean, you could just see, Park and Rec has to pull a profit. Is Jerry still behind me? Yes. Yeah. He is. Um, just checking, Jerry. <laughs> um, so you can see, like, special events, Celebrate East Lime over here. They're pulling, you know, most of the time they're pulling a profit. He has to pull a profit in order to keep this fund afloat, right? So what we're doing, when, when, when we ran the numbers and looked at this, what we're going to do is we're going to plug this $44,000 with the general fund. Right? So the open center staff is moving from Fund 18 into the general fund. So when we look at the uh, youth and family service budget, when we go over here and look, 
a lot of this a lot of this money we've already you know we spend every year uh, like Sarah said she's uh, she was the wellness prevention coordinator before she was the director that was paid with ARPA funds um, a lot of this is paid so it's really just a culmination of all these different funding sources we're pushing it together putting it into the general fund and what Sarah's talking about with the revenues work um, what I'm doing is saying okay look we know you're going to bring in fundraising revenue for the national night out. You're going to have a golf tournament. You're going to have all these things. We can't. She's. She, it's going to take her 50 years to dig herself out of a $200,000 hole. So what? What I proposed to do, and I think I got buy-in from everybody behind me, was just to say, okay, youth services going forward is zero, but all they're able to spend going forward is whatever revenue they brought in. Whereas before it was kind of it operated a little bit like a blank checkbook. Um, and that was backstopped by Park and Rec. Going forward, if they bring in ten thousand dollars of revenue, they can spend ten thousand dollars, not a dollar more. So th it's just a little accounting difference of what's happening here. So, so uh, youth and family services will still have a small section of Fund 18, but it will have a little more restrictions on how that is spent, right? So really, the general fund is kicking in more uh, of funds. Does that? I see a. I see a. I got a question. I, I, I'm just trying to get this straight in my mind. It it, it sounds like you've got a, a sum net loss for programs that have been being run, and you're transferring that sum net loss to a new department that then is going to be funded through the general fund, and then you're going to have a limitation by how much funds they can raise. Not raise, spend. Funds. They can raise. She raised a million dollars. If Sarah, you go out there, and you get a three hundred thousand dollar grant. The spend is limited by what they correct. Raise. But that's the fund as a whole is like that, right? Like I don't let Jerry or, or or the Commission on Aging. They also have a section of this fund. They also are are hampered by what they have available, right? So you know, um, if we pulled that back up, Park and Rec. Da, 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 da. So we go down here. Um, so Commission on Aging has $22,200, Park and Rec has 25000 right? Um, so every year, you know, Jer Jerry knows if he wants, uh, this fund has to stay in the, in the black. So he knows this year he's got he's to operate at least, the only, he can only have a $25,000, you know, $25, $157 loss before he, this fund is in trouble on Park and Rec's side. Does that make sense? So there's no, none of these, there's no blank checkbooks. I mean, he knows he's bringing in revenue, and, and the, de the department heads really budget for this every year. Um, so it's no different. I just think now that Sarah is her own, you know, director of a department, we're just splitting this out, you know, another way. So instead of Park and Rec, it'd be Park and Rec, then Youth Family Services, then Toots, then COA going forward. But she's not going to pull that, that cumulative loss. I'm not, we're not going to carry that forward and hamper that department. Right? That's going to stay over in Park and Rec. Sorry, Jerry. Um, but, uh, but we'll limit it there and then cap it going forward. But if you have salaries, there's two salaries that amount to about $126,000. Well, so let's go so back there and just talk that through. Line 211. Okay. So, so 211. 3 and 311, which is about 126000 Let me just pull it up real quick. Okay. So, so um, you, if you said that she's limited to what she can spend by what she raises, if she only raises like twenty or $30,000, She's going to be a hundred grand short. Nope, nope. This is funded. This is general fund funds. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's going to have to come out of the general fund. Correct. Yep. So the current budget is about two hundred eighty thousand, a tenth of a mil, roughly, yeah. for this department. So to start this new department, it's going to cost the taxpayers another hundred thousand plus. It's going to cost the taxpayers a, a tenth of a mil. Uh, two hundred eighty yeah. minus whatever. Yep. Yep. Minus. The revenues are going into the revenues for this are not going into the general fund. Yeah. So there's no offsetting revenues for this department. These offs I mean, if we get grants, things like that, you know, we can talk about it if it's three hundred thousand. But um but the you know, smaller grants and smaller things really go into that fund eighteen for them to do other programming outside of this. This is really what I look at this as a base budget and then if they can raise more revenue or get you know, supplemental grants, things like that. Then they can, you know, build out their services and things like that. Just from a bean counter side, not an operational side, Sarah. Okay, let me ask you this then: of all the services that were provided by Park and Rec in this realm, mm -hmm. how many extra services are going to be provided over and above what Park and Rec provided by you on youth services? 
To be honest, Park and Rec didn't provide a lot of youth programs. Well, and our goal is to, you know, when we look at other towns around us, they offer a lot and we don't offer anything. So you're, so you're saying you're going to provide the same basic set of services, things that the Park and Rec provided? To start, yeah. To start, so you're providing the same thing, but with some extras. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So how how uh, percentage wise, uh, how much are these uh, extras? Percentage wise, like thirty percent more you're going to be provide over in what Park and Rec provided? Yeah, I'd say thirty, fifty percent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask for a clarification, um, uh, Kevin? Um, where do grants fall in this? Do they go into the special revenue fund, or do they go into the general fund? To offset so, sorry expenses? for confusing you on that one. Yeah. Okay, so different. Gr okay, so like we get a uh, so youth services state of Connecticut grant nineteen thousand. Then there's a supplemental enhancement grant. Those are in the um, general fund, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Sarah? Those are in the general fund. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm 99.99% sure. If you flip to the front part of that book and go to the grant section, and I believe there is a, uh, I think it's 25000 I budgeted for that. Um, now, we have a grant fund now. So some of these other grants, like you see that opioid, opioid, opioid settlement money, um, that $20,000 estimate, we know we've received so far uh, $123,000, I think it was, um, as of today. Um, so we've established a grant fund. That money will come out of the general fund into this grant fund, and then as we, um, we recognize the revenue and we spend it, at the end of the year, there's an accounting to say, okay, we brought in 125000 in revenue, we spent seventy five. There's 50000 left in this grant to spend, and you carry that forward, right? So general fund we budget annually grant funds are multi-year that's why we really wanted a grant fund so when we get a grant you don't have to spend it that year we can spend it as we see fit going forward um but so as you spend it you transfer it into the general fund no no so oh, i'm sorry for giving you guys an accounting lesson <laughs> but um I'll, I'll mm, no <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So, like a lot of the state grants, we get like um, we get an excess cost grant for the Board of Ed. There's a lot of grants we know we're going to get from the state of Connecticut. We budget for those. Those are those offset taxes directly. Some of these other grants are like uh, competitive based. We don't know if we're going to get them. Those grants that we're not going to use to directly offset taxpayer dollars, we're going to use a supplement or complement, not supplement. Sorry. Um, uh, those will go into the the grant fund. Does that does that make sense, Jay? So basically, it depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have just started with that. It depends. <laughs> um, so. But the money stays in the grant fund. It doesn't go. Correct. At the end of the year, revert you get through into the general fund. Dollars. So it gets carried from year to year to year. So there's this incentive to uh, try not. Try not to use it all up and, and uh, hopefully build uh, uh, more um, revenue into that grant fund so they have a, something to carry forward to fall back on. Rich? Okay, so that opioid settlement, do we have allocations for the remainder of that? So the town hasn't. Uh, obligated a dollar of it. Give me one second. I'll tell you the actual dollar amount. I just sent it to Dan about three hours ago. Um, it's either 135 or 123. Both those numbers sound really good. Uh, they sound real good. <laughs> okay, as of $123,435.91 we received to date. Um, so we have $123,000 in there. Um, my initial proposal, uh, we have a meeting next week. No, this week. Wednesday. This week? This yeah. We have two days we have a meeting. I thought it was <laughs> next week. Um, we have a meeting with Youth Family Services. Um, one proposal I'm going to present, giving my poker chips away early again, um, is so we, we showed earlier that 
hundred uh, that forty four thousand dollar net loss uh, the forty three thousand nine forty seven okay so the reason the, the, everything plays into itself right so park and rec has a fund that is very close to breaking even it's in a danger zone we would classify that as um, and so park and rec really can't take anything on more in this fund or they can't buy things that they could say okay you know that tent we were talking about maybe if this fund had you know fifty sixty thousand in it jerry says okay I'll, we'll buy the tent out of the special revenue fund and going forward but the fund is at such a a small fund balance he's kind of hampered there a little bit jerry do you agree absolutely Okay, perfect. Um, so really, what could happen is if we could take forty-four thousand of that one hundred twenty-three thousand dollar opioid money and use it to offset the gap in revenues of expenditures last year, right? As long as we had enough, as long as we got forty-three thousand dollars last year in opioid money, um, and as long as it uh, is an allowable expense, it's for at-risk youth, and you know a bunch of other things it hits off, that would help us out there, and that would give Jerry a little more fund balance. Um, and then also we would do the same thing for 630-24. After 630-24, right, we didn't budget opioid money in the general fund. We didn't budget it anywhere. That money would sit in the grant fund, and then it would be able, it would be kind of a first come, first serve, or prioritization, or we'd have to get some sort of policy over how we dole that money out. Um, but that's how that tranche of money would be expended. Um, so okay. the, the reason I asked that was because in the budget page that we have for youth and family services okay. has 20000 for the opioid settlement. For revenue, correct? Yes. And I would assume that came from the opioid settlement. Correct, yeah. You yep. Now mention that we've got 125, 130, whatever the figure is. Um, and I just get concerned that you, you have a new agency that is directly addressing some of the effects of, of the opioids on families, not just youths, but families. And it, it just seems like if we have that much, that maybe we consider greater allocations or at least go through a prioritization process like what we did with the ARPA funding that with that windfall and not just say okay well we got to fill Jerry's bucket of the 41,000 so that they're able to get a tent through you know just as an example mm -hmm. I the, the concern that I have with these um, these I'll call them rotating funds mm -hmm. And it was seen at the at the senior center that I thought that they were kind of getting, or commission on aging, that they were kind of getting away from that concept of, I think the town was giving them money, or that they were raising money. I forget what it was, but one thing was getting eliminated, so that the, the programs could be sustainable. And yeah, the Tambari funds were going to cover um, supplies for kitchens and programs going forward in an effort to uh, maintain the additional part-time admin and that was added to the budget. Yeah, but, but my understanding was that the programs kind of sustained themselves by what the rates were charged. And here we have a department that like, you know, at best it sounds like you could raise maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to sustain your programs. And for programs which are greatly in need, I don't know that that really cuts it. And you're depending on raising money by fees on some programs. Like I, I noticed the revenue thing for the skiing mm -hmm. is tremendous. And yet yeah. there are many citizens in our town that can't afford to go skiing, but yet we're expecting these kids to kick in all this money to go ski. I, I, I don't know if I'm expressing myself well. So I know I, I think I get what you're saying. Um, so that I think that's a little policy based in, in as far as how that money's doled out. So I would defer to uh, the first selectman with regards to how the grant money's spent. I'll uh, I'll speak to accounting for it. Right. But um, but how how it's doled out is you know separate you know different conversation than I can. But but I hear I hear what you're saying. Yeah, it, it's just the fee based 
financing of programs and the the fund that covers the the programs if you're going to expand programs or have an expanding population that you're going to reach that may not be able to afford those fees it, i i think is almost self-defeating and that maybe it, it should i i hate to say this come out of the general fund because then you have at least a definite revenue source okay so can i just say i think we went full circle because that's kind of why we put it we decided to put it in the general fund was because we re recognized the the perpetual loss in in you know we were spending seventy five thousand dollars a year uh, and we were bringing about thirty thirty five um, so every year we're facing this you know thirty forty thousand dollar deficit and we thought hey you know what this has to continue it's an important uh, program we put on well, let's put it in the general fund oh, okay. and that does a couple different things it frees up Jerry you know the park and rec side of this fund right so now when you look at those lines you see there the I mean last year they had a four dollar a four dollar uh, net income on the entire beach operations. So it was, I mean, 280000 one way, 280000 and $4 the other way. Um, so it was, it was, you know, there, it's pretty close. It's pretty tight margins here. So if we could help um, the Park and Rec Special Revenue Fund by migrating this to the general fund instead of having all the other programs uh, subsidize that, right, and, and move that to the general fund, the Park and Rec Fund becomes more sustainable. Um, uh, Youth of Family Services has a, a, a steady uh, expense base. They know they're going to be able to keep, uh, f you know, budgeting for their uh, open center staff. Um, I, I just think it's more stable for all parties involved. And it does come at a cost of the general fund, um, but e either the general fund's going to general fund's going to pay for it, or um, Park and Rec is subsidizing it. Really, is what it comes down to. And not even park rec in the general fund. Park and rec, when you buy a beach pass or you go to a yoga class or, or celebrate East Lime, you're you're subsidizing that youth services a little bit there. So yep, yeah. And so, one more, one more question. Okay. Where will you be located? I'm at the youth center. That's where I'm housed. Next to the. Uh, Next to park and rec yeah. at the community center. Yep. Okay. Yeah, no one's changing. You didn't move. Right? No, I didn't move. Nope. And they've been doing renovations to give me more office space for the part-time therapist and then when I bring on the wellness and prevention coordinator. So we had a meeting over where she's located and, uh, um, you know, with Joe Berga and uh, Ron Benz, and we really looked at the space and we tried to uh, change the space in a way that, that would work for Sarah and, and uh, work in that whole area and try to make better use of what we had and I think we've largely done mm -hmm. that right and that's useful for you and um, but looking at the bigger picture um, so you, re you really had a situation where Parks and Rec was subsidizing some of the work that was now being done what is now being done by Youth and Family Services and uh, you're right that there are some services offered by the high school that are some are similar uh, to what they do at Youth and Family Services. Um, there's some uh, 501c3 organizations in town that offer some of these types of you know, counseling and mental health services, but it was recognized that there was a need for this type of service. And so, you know, do we expect Parks and Rec to subsidize this need, or do we just take it on the channel a little bit and say, look, this is something we recognize as being valuable. We'll have, the, we'll have it come out of the general fund, and we won't, we'll allow Parks and Rec to sort of operate the way they used to operate and, and try to build up and maintain their special revenue account without subsidizing some other area need in the town. So I think what it is, that there's a recognition that, you know what, this is important. I think we need to help pay for it and not put it on Parks and Rec. So I think that's where we are. And they do have some revenue options. And to the extent that they uh, are successful in getting grants and other things that they can do, um, that's all the better. And that's even more service that they can provide. So there's this incentive 
to do some of these fundraising things, but there's the backdrop of the town that's going to bankroll and say, look, this is important. We're going to make sure you have what you need to function. And if you can fundraise and do more, all the better. Does that help a little bit in understanding where we're coming from? Maybe not, but uh, um, it's an important service, and uh, in these times, it's necessary. Just quick. I just want to thank you for all the information you provided, and I've heard really wonderful feedback about the services that you've provided. And I'm wondering, because it is it is a big task, do you have volunteers, or how can people volunteer? I'm just thinking, like, I know people who might want to help with a beach dance or whatnot, who went to them growing up. Yeah, I rely a lot on my commission members, my board at the youth coalition the stakeholders that sit around the table this year i got lucky and i have an intern until may so yeah i'm very lucky to have support from the schools the police department my commission members and those that sit on the youth coalition so. and if just general town members want to volunteer is that oh yeah i'd happily take that help yeah and is the best way to just contact you directly yeah. Yep, email, phone. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Good point. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. And on to 522. Debt services interest. Yeah. 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 There we go. Kevin, for old eyes, is it possible to zoom in a little more? Zoom in a little bit more, I will please. Try, Rich. Thank you. I also know. Okay. <laughs> Especially Great. since we don't have pages for this. This wasn't in with the capital plan, right? Nope, it's not. Um by 10.5 million we have uh, 6.5 million dollars of bond of uh, bands bond anticipation notes that we have to convert um, so 4 million 227 okay. I'm just verifying that they match before you guys stress me out. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Um, so I don't know how you want to walk through this, if we want to go year by year. Um, so there's a few different things happening here. We have, uh, starting at the top, if, if um, everyone goes to the last page of the spreadsheet here, you know, your operating summary in the front part of the book. Second to last page. Make sure you guys 
stabilization schedule. Just for reference, it's at the um, right before Board of Ed and Capital Debt Service Section 522. General fund kicks in for two uh, uh, dirty drinking water, DWSRF, drinking water self-evolving fund. Um, so, everyone there? Mm -hmm. Okay, just wait to see where we are. Now I'll walk through the numbers. So, every year the town budgets $30,000 for fees related to bands, right? So, if you look in your book here, the very first line, band maturity. Last year's twenty-nine thousand three thirty-three. This year, I'm budgeting for thirty thousand, a whopping increase of seven hundred dollars. Um, and that is just for every year we have to. Um, there's all these little administrative fees that comes in with rolling uh, the bond participation notes. Um, so that's what that is used for, just to cover uh, legal fees, things like that. Jumping into the two uh, DWSRFs. In 2012, we took out a loan. We pay less than $4,000 a year for it. Uh, 2013, we pay $70,000 a year for that one. The reason why we do DWSRF uh, loans as opposed to bonds, it is a substantially lower interest rate. Uh, I believe a uh, current interest rate in this environment is 2% right now. The only problem is, uh, just right now, water and sewer is exploring them um, for some PFAS remediation. But uh, the problem is, while you're getting a great uh, loan interest rate, um, DWSRF comes with a lot more stipulations and it just increases the overall expense of the project. So it's a, it's a trade-off, what do you want? You want a you know, better interest rate or a higher total project cost? Uh, we rolled off one of the bonds, uh, the 2014 one is no longer, the, the newest bond we have is 26, the, the oldest bond we have, I'm sorry, is 2016. Um, so 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20, 22, and then 23, we took out a bond and we took out notes. All right? So um, the, the, the note we took out, interest, we will pay $326,000 this year, broken out between water, sewer, uh, between water, the town, and the Board of Ed. Uh, the town side will pick up $111,000 plus the Board of Ed side. So we pick up this one, and we pick up this one for 226584 And it's the last one of the interest account. So there's nothing we can do here with these. Yes. Yeah, you want to pay more? Not really anything to debate, but I think the, um, your overall thoughts is we would decrease the amount of band funding. Uh, ideal. So in conversations I've with other finance directors, um, you know, the question is, well, you're bonding every year. Why are you also taking out notes? Like, this is crazy. You're taking out a bond and notes every year. Um, so I, I, my hope is this year we roll that bond, that band into a bond, and we don't take out another note, right? We just get on a bonding schedule. We get away from the notes. We get away from the leases. Go to cash capital and bonds. Um, unless, you know, obviously we take, you know, new school or something like that where we need to have the 25 million fronted to us. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking, you know, three, four, or five million, um, we really can cover that, right? Um, so it's really just a matter of, of um, being a little more disciplined with that, with, with bonding. Um, so we've got to get ourselves out of this negative feedback. Loop. And I'm just curious, has, had an RFA been advising that or the financial um, advisor? To, to get rid of the bonds? No. Not to uh, get rid uh, of the uh, bonds. No, it's, yeah. It seems to be a practice that's been going on here for a while. Um, it doesn't appear we've changed our bond uh, advisor or our financial advisor that since I've been here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something just, to explore. Just wondering whether we need to yeah. put that relationship back to bid. It's conversations we're having, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, In your spare time. Yeah, <laughs> I can, um, we can have a conversation. So, um, besides that, there's there's not much going on here. It's just really, uh, you've heard me talk about this. I'd like to get off or, or wean back 
uh, debt and increase cash a little bit here and get us in a better better uh, picture. So. You know, just on a very global looking down on it all, um, these are some painful times right now, but we're getting we're getting through this you know audit process with the state of Connecticut. We're getting that behind us. We're we're, we're really changing our philosophy a little bit about you know ban funding and cash capital, and uh, you know we're starting to think about the right things. And I think we're going to get to a much better place than we've been. Mm -hmm. So these transitions and you know changing the accounting system, the, the newness, getting uh, and going to that system, um, there's a lot of positive things that are going to happen. It's just it ain't happened yet. That's all. But it, we're in the we're in the process of it, and I think we're going to be in a much better place down the road as all these things take hold. I agree. Okay. So that was interest, and then principal. That's the same conversation. Yeah, we're same just, just checking off, check off my agenda items here. So, oh, you got yeah. and then CNRE, have we pretty much? Yes, yeah, so I put that in there for the, for the departments to talk about it. Yeah. Um, Commission on Aging doesn't have anything. Yeah. Um, Park Rec talked about theirs. Um, and then the only ones I would just touch upon that kind of spearhead out of my office, um, office furniture replacement program to update some of those chairs up there and the chairs we're sitting on, um, get some cubes in my office for the for my staff, and then the um, AV upgrade. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to stand up. I think my legs are paralyzed. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go, I had two hours in, I had to get up go for a walk. Yes. I couldn't feel my left leg. So, um, but besides that, um, how about the Denali for the first walk? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to replace all those cars and give you a replacement. Oh. Oh, right. yeah. Maybe that'll six uh, expedition. Yeah. That's okay. that's <laughs> all right. So next is public discussion, and our public is all left. <laughs> so we could move on to board comments. So um, I would just say uh, tomorrow night is our meeting uh, where the sole agenda item uh, of substance is our deliberations. I really uh, hope that we can get this all done tomorrow night. We put the Thursday meeting on the books just in case we couldn't wrap it up in one night, but hopefully everybody can come prepared to make any of their uh, suggestions and be prepared to vote if we can. All good? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Move. moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned.